So where are we on the legislation? We currently have 38 co-sponsors on this bill. Um, I hope Nomi Prince, when she speaks, will talk about bringing on the most recent one, Julie Bromley. Uh, the formula that everybody is using works. Uh, all of you can do the same thing. Uh, so we hope that you'll sign on board and uh, push this act forward um, as we go uh, into the Democratic National Convention and the presidential election. I'm quite proud of the fact that uh, Illinois Congress uh, people are leading the charge on this uh, nationally. Um, just to uh, comment a little bit of, on what uh, Congressman Garcia said, uh, you know, even though Illinois has passed a, a huge infrastructure bill back in 2019, we passed a $45 billion infrastructure bill. And uh, as the Congressman said, we've uh, received from the federal government an additional $17 billion and that's that's funding a lot of bridges, roads, uh, uh, schools, uh, universities, uh, you know, wastewater system projects. It still isn't enough. You know, in Washington State, um, we passed a joint memorial to support this, which pretty much explains my interest in it. You know, a joint memorial is something that passes both chambers of the legislature, the House and the Senate, and um, was a a statement of our intentions and desires to all of our congressional delegation, uh, to Congress and the president to please pass the National Infrastructure Bank proposal 4052 and for the president to sign on to it. Uh, the National Infrastructure Bank established by this legislation, and I'll refer to it simply as the bank or the NIB from now on, will first permit state and local governments to take out loans that are effectively interest free. Second, to make infrastructure investment that in most instances will generate enough revenue to effectively pay for itself over the life of the loans. And third, while still permitting the bank to make enough profit to enable it to subsidize state and local infrastructure investment that produces a public benefit. Believe it or not, the president of the United States was in Saginaw, Michigan, and I had the opportunity to go and um, to the house where we was at. And I had opportunity to tell him that we needed a $5 trillion infrastructure bill passed. And he grabbed me by my shoulders like he was laying hands on me. I thought I was at a uh, uh, sanctified church or something. He said, uh, son, I just did a $1.2 trillion bill. I said, I know, but we need a $5 trillion bill because we need to get people to work back here. Why we can provide financing for, at the moment, $5 trillion, but as Alfeca outlined, um, potentially up to $6.6 .6 trillion worth of uh, funding to decrease or basically get rid of that infrastructure gap that we currently face right now across all these categories as a nation. And it's a really simple mechanism that commercial banks have used basically forever. Um, and what it requires is repurposing debt that already exists. Massachusetts, we all know one of the first states of this country and being one of the first states means we have some of the oldest infrastructure. Uh, we've got 5,200 bridges, 8.7% of those bridges are structurally deficient. 50%, 57% of our roads are in poor condition or fair condition. 1,200 miles of roads are in poor condition. Commute times have increased 11% since 2011. And motorists spend on average $620 per year driving on roads in needs of repair. Um, I grew up in China. I grew up in China at a time when when China was not this super modern, super connected um, country that is threatening to take over the United States economy and the competing with us. OK, and when I came to this country by myself, America was it. America symbolized modernization. America was the country that defined the future. This problem, as you well know, did not start in the last five, 10 years. It started 30, 40 years ago. And especially when you live outside of the urban area, infrastructure is one of the most important assets we have. The reason why I love the National Infrastructure Bank is it's basically the gift that keeps on giving, right? We're never going to run out of infrastructure projects. We're never going to run out of needs. At the end of the day, as soon as we finish our big, long laundry list of things we need to get done, we have to start all over again. And the infrastructure bill that Biden signed in uh... November of 21, it far, falls far short of the need. Uh, just to give you an example here in uh, New Mexico, um, we have the second sunniest state 
and the fifth windiest, so we have a lot of potential to produce uh, renewable energy, and yet there was no money. There were, there were 13 categories in the Biden bill, and one of them was the electric grid. We get receiving no money for that. We don't have the money for the infrastructure that we need. And where is it going to come from then? We need some sort of workaround. Uh, Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton faced a similar situation in 1791 when they had a $44 million debt from the Revolutionary War. And so Hamilton's solution was to turn the debt into capital for the first bank of the U.S. So state debt was accepted in partial payment for stock in the bank, paying a 6% dividend. So this bank would, NIB would pay a 2% dividend. Here in Georgia, um, we've really had a, a systemic failure uh, to invest in reliable forms of public transportation, uh, which has made the metro Atlanta area and the city of Atlanta the eighth most, in, the eighth most uh, congested city in the world. Uh, in 2016, 90% of trips in Georgia were, were, were made using automobiles, while only 2% were made by transit. This is, in my mind, one of the most important things we can do to protect um, uh, our workers, our families, our health, uh, and uh, the environment. Uh, here in where I am in New York City in Brooklyn, um, I have a, a tremendous amount of uh, transportation uh, infrastructure, but that also goes hand in hand with um, uh, the environmental impacts, the environmental justice impacts uh, throughout our area, um, and a real lack of sewer capacity. We've had people drowning in their own homes because of a lack of sewer capacity. We have areas that flood routinely. One of the areas in my district is, a, is wetlands, toxic wetlands that were um, subject to a lot of uh, environmental pollution. Many of you know Chicago has the most lead service lines going from the street to the houses of any city in the country. And coming up with the billions of dollars needed to pay for that um, is going to be a challenge without something like the National Infrastructure Bank to be able to lend money to the city. So the first issue that I'll highlight that the National Infrastructure Bank and the funding that, of course, would come with it um, would really help us with um, is water infrastructure. And I think this is something that we're dealing with, of course, across the country and across the world, really, um, with the realities of climate change that we're experiencing now and that we've been, you know, kind of taking hits on um, over the last few years. The National Infrastructure Bank, I think, is groundbreaking. <clears throat> Because one of the things that we don't have in Georgia and multiple communities, whether it be in urban communities or rural communities, we don't have five basic things. If you make $70,000, excuse me, or less, uh, you will not find in your community these five things, not in tandem. Number one, you won't find a bank. You won't find a grocery store. You won't find a doctor. You won't find a school you want to send your kid to. And you certainly won't find transportation to get you to a living wage job. The NIB could focus on those things and bring real change to Georgia, both in rural communities and in urban communities. But it can actually change the way in which we uh, move business in America.